In the emergency department, we see a lot of patients with hallucinations. Now, hallucinations come in two varieties, auditory or visual. Auditory hallucinations are quite often psychiatric, but at least when it comes to visual hallucinations, it's really important that we keep a very broad differential because most of the time, this is not a psychiatric issue. So to discuss a good differential for visual hallucinations, my guest today is Dr. Ajwa Smith-Monte, an emergency psychiatrist at Bellevue and other hospitals in New York City. How do you see the difference between auditory and visual hallucinations? So when I'm evaluating somebody coming in for auditory hallucinations, many times it's one or two things. It is they are really truly having auditory hallucinations or they can more so be intrusive thoughts. And that's a whole nother topic for another time. But when people come in complaining of visual hallucination, that really made me think, is there something else medical going on? Because visual hallucinations are not as common in psychiatric disorders, primarily schizophrenia is what we're thinking about. And I want to make sure that I'm not missing something very important medically. When people seem to really be having visual hallucinations, like they're describing to me right in front of me what they're seeing, or somebody else told me they saw this, they're describing this person or kid outside the window sitting on a bench and there is nobody there, then I start to really probe what are the medical things that can also be causing this. Yeah, that's great. So maybe you could run through with me what a medical differential would be for visual hallucinations. Yeah, and I think that's important because if I think of all the cases I've seen in about 10 years, um, I can maybe think of two cases where a person clearly had schizophrenia, they were having visual hallucinations. When people come in with visual hallucinations, I'm often thinking, what is the medical reason? Because that's usually what is going on. And I'm thinking either drugs, it's withdrawal or intoxication. Could it be something happening in the brain, like a tumor, something in the optic nerve tract? Could somebody have a Lewy body disease? Then also, could they be having seizures or even migraines? So those are the top things on my differential when people are talking about visual hallucinations. And then last, as she comes, maybe they have just schizophrenia. Gotcha. Okay, so let's walk through each one of those and let's start with maybe the withdrawals that you mentioned. What withdrawals could present with visual hallucinations? Merely the withdrawal I see hallucinations are, are with alcohol withdrawal and benzo withdrawal. And for that, you have a lot of clues. I mean, people smell like alcohol. They will tell you that they've had a lot of alcohol in the past two days ago or 24 hours ago. And then you're seeing a lot of other autonomic symptoms. And if people are really having visual hallucinations with alcohol withdrawal, that's pretty serious. And they usually need a medically supervised detox. Also, when it comes to drugs, besides withdrawal, you can see it with intoxication. So recall having a patient that was literally telling me, I see people's faces in trees up there on the ceiling, and they had used something recently on a trip and they had come back and they were, that's what they were seeing. And we don't know exactly what substance it was, but usually LSD, PCP, Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Alcohol withdrawal. And it sounds like we're talking about like a delirium tremens type of picture by that's the right. time they're seeing those visual hallucinations. And with benzos, it can be this a similar picture. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. So that makes sense. We have to think about withdrawal from drugs. We have to think about intoxication with like hallucinogenic drugs. I'm sure psilocybin can be on that list too. Yeah. Okay. So let's go from that to the next one. What's next on your list? I also think about, is there something happening in the brain? And um, usually someone that's older, you're thinking, okay, do it, what is their past medical history? What can give me a clue that there could be something happening? So you're thinking tumor first, usually, or right. could they have some retinal or optic tract issues? So I'm um, asking those questions. If somebody has a history of cancer, I usually do ask, hey, can we do a CT scan at least just to make sure there are no metastases? I will say very sadly, I did see a person probably a couple of months ago that came in with very clear visual hallucinations that they were seeing somebody outside sitting on a bench that where the whole family was like, there is nothing outside. And they had a history of cancer. 
And unfortunately, that had happened. They had had metastases. Yeah, totally reasonable. I think if we see a patient with visual hallucinations, I think it's pretty much on us to probably get a head CT on those patients to make sure there's no mass, no, no lesion there that could be causing that. Especially if they're a little bit older. If it's a very young person, they're 14, 15, they have no other symptoms. Um, probably not. But if it's someone that has a complicated medical history, of course, you would have done your neurologic exam. Maybe you would have found something that hinted at something there than um, doing a head CT. I think that makes sense. Okay. What else? Seizures as well. A lot of people, um, depending on where their seizure locus is, having visual hallucinations could be a component of it, but more so as um, a symptom of aura. And those don't tend to, for some people, it can be like very well-formed images that they're having um, with their um, seizures. But also you have aura and migraines and people might describe having visual hallucinations, but what they're really describing are visual distortions. They're not really clear formed images of a person, of an animal, of an object, but more like it'll look like waves or um, black dots or something like that. You're, you're thinking of those type of um, electrical activity that could be happening in someone's head. So preceding a seizure, someone with seizure disorder could be having visual disturbances. Mm -hmm. We got to look into that, see if they have a history of those seizures, if they're on any medicines for seizures and manage that first. Mm -hmm. And then the probably second most common thing that I see after withdrawal from alcohol, the, um, the second most common cause of visual hallucinations is a Lewy body disease. So whether they are, um, we really classify them as having Lewy body dementia, um, where they have all of those other symptoms and it's early on in the disease process. So a lot of times we're not quite sure what's happening. It could be the first symptom. And then you probe into the history and think, okay, maybe they have Lewy body dementia developing or we know that they have Parkinson's disease. They're being treated with a medication like levodopa, which can very well cause visual hallucinations. Definitely, that would probably be the second most common cause of visual hallucinations that I see, either just the disease process itself with Lewy body disease or medications for treating Parkinson's. So would you say specifically Lewy body dementia? Like if it's a patient with Alzheimer's dementia, would they... Is it less likely? Yeah, Alzheimer's dementia, less likely to have visual hallucinations. That's actually pretty rare. If people have visual hallucinations, it's always going to end up being Lewy body disease or Lewy body dementia. Now, I imagine for Lewy body dementia, that might be a hard diagnosis to make in the emergency department. How would you recommend going about screening for that? So that is hard. In the emergency room, I'm primarily getting history from the person themselves and any other collateral that I can get from family, friends, people that have been around. I'm not going to have the time to do a full cognitive assessment. It's really also not optimal to do it in a busy emergency room when you're not well rested with a lot of people there. So you're, you have a high suspicion of that and people are showing up in the emergency room, it's usually because there's a behavioral component also. They're described as agitated by family, friends, their behavior has come mm -hmm. out of control, they're more paranoid. And so then sometimes there's an opportunity to admit them to the hospital where we can have more periods of observation and can make a definitive diagnosis. And I suppose with Parkinson's, if the patient's on Parkinson's meds, that's gonna be pretty apparent. Because, you know, taking too much, even just a little bit too much of that can cause those hallucinations. Yes. And really for that, the number one thing that you want to do is to reduce the medications as much as you can. So that really um, is on the patient's neurologist. Okay. And what else? You can also think about general medications as well. I think in medical school, we often learn about digoxin toxicity and that it can cause alterations in your vision. Things might look a little bit yellow. Mm. Have I seen that clinically? No, but it's something yeah. to also keep on the differential. Um, think about um, being on steroids can also cause mm. psychotic and more so people have odd thinking and they are a little bit delirious as times and just a little bit more confused, not necessarily hallucinating as much, but it could happen. So you want to okay. think as 
providers, as physicians, what we're giving to people that could also cause this. A question I have is, let's say we are managing these patients with like visual hallucinations and we would like to give them something to help with their symptoms, at least while they're in the ER and they're very distressed. Can we run through that differential and talk about what medication you might give them? So in most cases, I would feel all right with giving somebody an antipsychotic if I think it's from alcohol withdrawal or they've taken something like LSD, PCP. Actually, having those dopamine blockers is very effective. And I'm usually opting to use a first generation antipsychotic like Thorazine or Haloperidol. In those cases, just to provide somebody with relief. If I'm thinking it's a seizure, usually there's so much that goes into it, but people are normally okay that you're you're just saying, all right, as long as they are in behavioral control, let, let's just let them ride. It'll be okay. Most people are not doing anything to act on what they think that they're seeing. So that's fine. Okay. If I'm really concerned about a, a brain mass or something like that, and we actually find it, we're, we're still not doing anything waiting. The one thing that I will say is when I suspect is Lewy body disease, we do often want to give something to help with someone's um, hallucinations and their agitation. And you have to be very careful that you're not giving an antipsychotic with very heavy antidopaminergic activity because that can also be problematic in the long run. So I'm probably going to use something like Seroquel or Clauseril, they have less antidopaminergic activity. And if someone has Parkinson's disease, again, their whole issue is that they don't have enough dopamine. So we don't want like antipsychotics, they work primarily by blocking dopamine. And so those two antipsychotics, again, the Seroquel and the Clauseril or the Quetiapine and Clozapine, they have the less antidopaminergic activity that is what we would prefer to use. But if somebody has a known Parkinson's disease, the first thing that you're going to do is try to lower the levodopa or any dopaminergic agent that they are on first. But it is safe to prescribe judiciously some antidopaminergics to these patients to at least temporize the situation while we stabilize it. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you.